Hi, this is Luke with The Gamer, and this is a beginner's guide to Dead Island 2. While Dead Island 2 is most certainly a game that is filled with zombie slaying opportunities, it's also safe to say that exploration is just as big of a part of the game. You'll be unlocking doors, finding secret nooks and crannies, and generally searching every map from top to bottom to locate all events and key items. But as you explore in the early game, you're going to be left with a number of questions. Like where do I find these safe keys? Or what is up with these fuses? There are also a number of systems and mechanics that are extremely easy to miss. So that's where we come in. We'll provide you with everything you need to start your zombie slaying adventure off on the right foot. When the game begins, you'll be given a chance to pick your slayer. For all intents and purposes, these characters work as traditional class archetypes. While their stats are important, especially their lowest stat which sits at a disastrous 1 star, you want to pay especially close attention to their skill cards. However, while all of this is important, there is one other element that you need to consider. These characters are not silent. Well, that's one less neighbour at book club this month. Though they're all smart asses to some degree, they do have strong, well-established personalities. Another thing to consider when choosing your Slayer is that some of them start with the block, like Carla and Ryan, while others start with the dodge ability. Both of these defensive skills are effective, but are somewhat situational. Blocking is more effective in tight spaces, while dodging is more effective in open spaces. However, don't allow yourself to be overcome by fear of missing out. You will eventually unlock the other defensive options as well. There's other little differences sprinkled throughout these choices too. Like Bruno starts with the flying kick instead of the drop kick, but all these differences will resolve themselves over the course of the game, as everyone will unlock the alternate skills. A quick and easy source of money early in the game is selling first aid kits. At the beginning of the game when you don't have too much money, you're going to want to buy those sweet fuses from Carlos. So to do this you're going to need to build up some quick cash. You can only hold 5 first aid kits at any time, but you'll find plenty of them as you're out and about, and they give you 100 bucks per kit. Another thing to keep in mind is that you can only carry 99 of any given crafting material, so if you're already holding onto a ton of something, it's worth selling a decent chunk of it before you head out on your next mission. If you fill up, you're just going to have to leave it behind anyway, so lighten your load and cash in. Finally, weapons are the most valuable source of funds. Unfortunately, you won't be able to sell the common stuff, so you're not going to be able to start making money until you encounter uncommon or green weapons. Once you do, however, you will officially be able to cash in. And on the topic of saving money, don't buy weapons. You'll find so many during your travels, most of them far better than the ones you can buy from traders. Instead, use that money to repair your damaged, rarer weapons. If you can bring yourself to take a break from stomping zombies long enough to take a gander at the menu, you'll find the challenges section. This is filled with everything from challenges for killing a certain amount of zombies simultaneously with shurikens, to collecting all the blueprints. Naturally, completing these challenges will yield rewards. While some of the challenges provide pretty tepid rewards, Others provide substantial benefits. We're talking about permanent stat boosts and blueprints. And these are incredible benefits. Now the bigger rewards are attached to the longer term goals, but it is wise to take a look on occasion, as this will help you know which of these challenges you are on track to complete, and maybe help guide you towards the challenges you've been neglecting. As you loot and plunder your way through the fabulous homes of Hell A, you are going to find a ton of locked doors or safes that seemingly have no way to be unlocked. We know that we spent a lot of time in the early going searching for the keys to get into these places, however that is not time well spent. Most of the keys you're looking for will only become available later through side missions. If you're looking for fuses on the other hand, you'll be able to purchase them when you start meeting traders, and this is the only way to acquire fuses. There is one notable exception though. Some cars, chests and vaults will be opened by killing zombies in the area. Typically, it isn't hard to tell when a key can be found on a nearby zombie, as you will be told that you need something like an electrician's key or the coach's key. If the key belongs to a class of worker as opposed to a named NPC, it is more likely that you'll be able to find it on one of the zombies shambling around in the nearby area. However, if you look and can't find them, they may not appear until later in the game. After you start unlocking the special types of zombies, they will start to populate every map you have explored. If you're looking for a certain zombie to unlock a certain safe or door, and one of these spawn locations appears on the map near said locked safe or door, there's a good chance that that is the zombie you are looking for. Even if you haven't played previous Dead Island games, 
It probably won't take long for you to figure out that a big part of the game is checking every box, crate, drawer and bag you encounter. This is also true after zombies have attacked. Sometimes these scripted moments will cause them to burst out of doors that were previously locked. So once you clear an area of zombies in a set piece moment, it's worth checking the area again. Also, while zombies will return to areas you have previously cleared out, items will respawn as well. So when you're passing through an area you've previously explored, you can once again loot everything in there. Over time you'll learn which places have the best stuff, and it doesn't hurt to take a slight detour to grab some of the rarer ingredients. The Chem Bomb is one of the first curveballs you will obtain in Dead Island 2. However, while you'll quickly amass an arsenal of potent curveballs that far outclass it in combat, the Chem Bomb is a truly invaluable method of clearing up most hazards. The Chem Bomb puts out fires and removes caustic puddles which make it utterly invaluable. It's very easy for the Chem Bomb to get lost in the shuffle of curveballs, but it's way more convenient to go into your inventory section to swap it out for a better curveball in intense battles than to have to constantly pick up jerry cans to nullify hazards. When you are exploring, always have your chem bombs on hand. They will make your life so much easier. During your time as a slayer, you're going to find you frequently fill up on weapons. Of course, you shouldn't be afraid to break down weapons into their component pieces, as you will always have a steady supply of new weapons. But you will inevitably be left in a position where you may want to hold on to all the weapons in your arsenal and more at some point. Thankfully, your weapon locker will hold on to the weapons that you leave behind as long as they aren't common weapons. So when you run into a situation where you're fully stocked, then don't be afraid to leave something behind, because it'll be waiting for you in your safe house the next time you return to base. You will naturally find weapons that you enjoy using during your time as a slayer. However, while you may favour a certain weapon type, we encourage you to be mindful of how different weapons match better with certain zombie types. Sure, you might like those hard-hitting, slow-swinging heavy weapons, but as excellent as those are for dispatching your shambler zombies, when you run into zombies such as runners, they'll dodge charged attacks, so a quicker weapon is much better for stopping them in their tracks. Slobbers, on the other hand, are easily disrupted by heavy attacks, so your big honking heavy two-hander is perfect for slobbers. Crushers, though, tend to shrug off those heavy attacks, so the faster the weapon, the better. Knives are especially excellent at dealing with crushers, so it's a good idea to have a weapon of each type, as having a versatile arsenal will make your life a lot easier. But it's doubly important to balance your roster when you start getting different elemental mods. You don't want to make all your weapons inflict fire damage, and then run into a gang of firemen zombies who are completely immune to fire-based weapons. During your time stalking the streets of Hell A, you will encounter a wide variety of zombies. However, one of the more interesting, and you may think potentially dangerous zombies are the exploding types. And we say types as there are multiple permutations. You have shockers who erupt into a giant field of electricity. You have grenadiers who are unsurprisingly covered head to toe in grenades and will explode as soon as you strike them. And then there are bursters who rush towards you and explode once they're close enough. So then, why are all these horrors your friends? Because you have a drop kick, and it launches all of these zombies. This is especially potent with the bursters who will be pushed far enough away from you to not cause damage, but will instantly explode their bodies without them having time to flee. But it isn't just a drop kick. With the shockers and the grenadiers, you'll have plenty of warning before they blow, so you can set them off as a horde approaches and get distance just in time to blow the whole group into bits. From luring zombies into live wires, to kicking them into electrical signs, or setting barrels alight and burning whole groups of zombies, there are tons of ways to take advantage of your environment. As an example, you can take advantage of jerry cans. You can extend hazards with them, create a trail of water leading to a live wire, and you can smash a window setting off an alarm. And you will have zombies running straight into a death trap. However, you'll need to be cautious yourself. Those red barrels are primed and ready to explode with a nudge. So be careful as a careless swing could see you getting blown away alongside all of those zombies. Early in the game, you will unlock the dropkick ability. This is an incredibly powerful tool. Not only is it fantastic for knocking zombies down, but zombies will ricochet between each other, meaning that you can fire a zombie into a group of them, sending them all flying. This makes it an invaluable tool for tight spaces like hallways. Use it in conjunction with doorways to manage a horde brilliantly. 
One of the things that makes this attack so strong is the ability to use it without having to build up any momentum first. In fact, you can even jump away from a zombie and stick the dropkick out there to help you cover your retreat. It's also worth noting that the dropkick does not count as a counter attack, so runners won't dodge it. The dropkick is also an amazing way to send bursters flying, turning them into a weapon at your disposal. <laughs> When killing zombies, you should really be viewing the experience you get as a nice little bonus. And hey, you are going to kill a lot of zombies, so those experience points will start to stack up. But here's the thing, a story mission takes about 30 minutes or so to complete, and they reward you with something close to 100 zombies worth of experience. And you might think that harder zombies are a better grinding opportunity, but sadly you'll be mistaken. Zombies above your level provide no extra bonus. Special zombies on the other hand are worth more experience, but they take way longer to kill than a standard zombie. So even if they are worth 3 times as much experience as a regular zombie, they are probably a less efficient source of experience than just killing shamblers. There are exceptions of course. Once the screamers start to show up, you can use them to generate dense crowds of zombies, so if you do want to grind, at least wait for the screamers to start showing up. Another case where you may want to fight groups is that if you are aggressively pursuing those zombie challenges. And if that's the case, then grind away Slayer. So there's some of our tips to help you get started in Hell A. Have a great time Slayers, and check out thegamer.com for more.